the intro. So tune in the intro. Well, that didn't work too good. So hold on, media source. Media source, transform, and I have to hit the screen. For now, to the end. All right, so my YouTubers are back and control two, control Q. All right, welcome to our program on circuit breaker selective coordination uh, tables. Uh, so this, you know, the selective coordination tables is something that uh, a lot of people don't, un don't realize are out there as a resource. They have been there for a, for not forever. I mean, when I used to do that back in the day, um, I didn't have the luxury of the, having that tool available. Uh, but today, uh, you do. And um, I'm going to help, help just demystify some of that for everybody so that you get to understand it and, uh, and understand how to use those tables and uh, all of the manufacturers of, uh, of uh, circuit breakers produce these tables. So what I'm going to talk about today, you can, um, I don't care what manufacturer you're, you're using. <laughs> Hopefully you're going to be using this one, but you may not be. Uh, but in any case, what I'm going to be talking about is not just an Eaton thing. Uh, it is um, available across the board from all circuit breaker manufacturers. Very important uh, piece of the pie. So for those, for everybody out there on uh, YouTube land, I, I had the intro, the uh, sign-in sheet for, if you have questions, I, I was talking about earlier, my 70E program on Thursday is, uh, is with Jim Dollar and we're answering 70E questions. So if you have questions, please send them. I'm gonna put the link out there to, uh, for those on, uh, on YouTube. And I'm going to do the same thing over here on our WebEx. for 70 e questions so there's the menti uh, link for those on um on webex and for my facebookers facebookers the -E okers yeah um the 70 e questions q u e s t I O N S, enter here. Control V, and I am hitting enter. So, and Valerie, thanks for joining. Dominic, happy birthday, buddy. Shout out to you. Happy birthday. I think yesterday was your birthday, if I'm not mistaken. There are some birthdays today, too. Um, but, uh, and Michael Johnson's birthday was not too long ago as well. So, happy birthday to everybody. I don't know how many birthdays Mike Johnson's had over the years, but he's had a lot of them. Because um, every time we go out to dinner, it's his birthday. All right, so we're going to talk about circuit breaker selective coordination tables. I've uh, I've gave every, given everybody the uh, the information with regard to um, the sign in, so hopefully you were able to get that. Um, if you didn't, I know there are other people out there that will chat it for you. Okay, so. All of your phones on WebEx have been muted, so that's just a reminder. Those who are on Facebook and who are on YouTube don't have the issue of, uh, of being able to talk. <laughs> I love that. I'm the only one allowed to talk. Uh, so, But those of you on WebEx, you've all been muted on entry. 
Uh, you do have the please leverage the chat box. Uh, we've been dialoguing on, dialoguing on in that. You can send me a chat directly. Uh, I will not try to read those out loud. Every now and then I screw that up. But um, if you want to chat with me personally, you can do that. I believe you can even chat with each other one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. Uh, so we've got a good host of people out there on uh, YouTube land or WebEx land and, uh, and YouTube land and Facebook land. So thanks for joining everybody uh, uh, for this lovely program. So let's, we're going to talk about the selective coordination tables. If you're familiar with selective coordination, uh, it's a, it's a process of, of, uh, of turning thing, of, of making sure that you only take out the loads closest to the fault. Uh, the Menti check-in code. Yes, I can. I'm going to write that number down because I know that's going to be asked again. The Menti code is 1969 and 42. So I'm going to get my little notebook with my Keith Laughlin pen. I don't know if you guys know this, but Keith Laughlin makes some awesome pens. So six, 1969 and 42. So check in is menti.com 196942. All right. So the, the tools that you should have in your basket from a selective coordination perspective. Obviously, we need the time current characteristic curves, and we're going to talk about time current characteristic curves here in a little bit, just to get everybody on the same playing field. I'm not, this isn't a class on TCC curves, but you have to understand the TCC curve and what it provides, what it can and what it can't tell you. Um, definitively. Uh, next, we're going to, the next tool you have in your toolbox is your short circuit calculations, which I have a whole program on short circuit calculations. I have a whole program on selective coordination as well from a few weeks ago. It's out there on my YouTube channel. And, uh, and then you, the understanding the uh, selective coordination tables. These are some really important tools uh, that you need when you are doing your systems analysis studies. We can't do a selective coordination study without knowing our fault currents. Now, to understand the time current characteristic curve, uh, the TCC curve, <clears throat> you have to understand that it's a, uh, it's a log to log, uh, log, logarithmic to logarithmic paper. So uh, the space in between, you know, usually when we deal with, with um, graph paper, uh, in between the gradients, they're all equal distances. And if you cut one in half, if, if you have the first, the first bar is at uh, one and the second bar is at 10. You split that in half and that's five, right? That doesn't work on log to log paper. Uh, so when you're, what you're looking at here are these different gradients. Uh -oh, I, got, uh, I got a leaker here on WebEx. Let me please make sure you are muted on WebEx. I do have one person who is not muted. There you are. Nope, that's not you. You must have just done that. Okay. Please uh, double check your WebEx to make sure that uh, you are muted. So these log to logs, what you have to remember is that it, the distance in between these is not equal. You'll notice that the lines get closer and closer together, uh, both on the horizontal and on the vertical. Across the bottom, we have amps. Uh, so uh, if you split that if you split these, any of these right down the middle, it's not directly in half. So that's why it's sometimes kind of difficult to, when you're looking at a TCC curve, you're always estimating values. Uh, you're not going to get an actual value unless you... Uh, somebody just ripped paper. You gotta figure out who that is. There you go. Oh. All right, I think you muted yourself. So, um, across the bottom we have current, and it's important to remember that the the distance in between. So, unless you're actually using a software application, it's hard to really pinpoint the exact value on each of these curves. 
Uh, ac- up the side, you have time. So across the bottom is current, up the side is time. And again, it's log to log. And you'll notice that these are all in seconds, right? So you have 0.01 seconds, 0.1 seconds, one second, 10 second, 100 seconds. And your TCC curve, this is the standard. They cut off the bottom at 0.01 seconds. Uh, selective coordination is not about time. It's about current and time. So I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I'm a 0.1 second, a point, down to 0.01 seconds. We're going to help you understand that those terminologies really don't make sense when you are doing a selective coordination study. I will use a laser pointer. Um, so uh, what you'll, when you think about the, um, when you think about this curve, so this is a, a circuit breaker curve here. And for each of these values of current, for any of the current values across the bottom, I can, for any current value, go up and over to determine what is the clearing time for that circuit breaker. They call the circuit breaker curves inverse time uh, over current devices. Because when, when the reason we say inverse time is because the higher the fault current, as fault current increases, the faster the clearing time. So as you, and that's why they call it inverse. So I have larger currents, lower clearing times, smaller currents, longer clearing times. The TCC curve, this trip curve for this circuit breaker is a very critical, I call it the resume for circuit breakers, for the overcurrent device. Fuses and circuit breakers will have a time current characteristic curve that tells you how they perform based upon current. The job of the selective coordination engineer is to plot these on a, on, a, on a trip curve with upstream and downstream devices to understand how they work as a, uh, as a system. So we have to understand what selective coordination is. The primary goal and function in selective coordination is to make sure that the downstream overcurrent protective device trips before the upstream overcurrent device. So what you're seeing over here is a lack of selective coordination because I have two breakers opening for a fault downstream. What you see on the, on the right-hand side of your screen is the way things are supposed to happen from a selectively coordinated perspective. The, the overcurrent device, in this case, the circuit breaker, closest to the fault, clears the fault, and no other device uh, is, uh, is affected. Now, what this does, as you can see on, uh, on the screen here, all of these devices are all opened. They're not opened. They're no longer energized. So what happened in the case on the left-hand side was a fault downstream of a branch circuit device took out a feeder, which then took out more, it extended the outage to areas of the facility, could be your home, could be a commercial installation, could be an industrial facility. I have taken out more than one breaker. I've extended the outages where on the right-hand side, I've only opened the circuit breaker that is closest to the fault and none of the entire rest of, of the distribution system is impacted. This is important from a reliability perspective. So, um, you know, it, it, selective coordination is a code requirement for some applications, but uh, selective coordination is something that a design engineer or a facility will voluntarily do because they want to increase the reliability of the power distribution system. Now, if we look in Article 100 of the National Electrical Code, they have a definition <clears throat> for uh, the or what selective coordination is. Selective, co selective coordination is the localization of an overcurrent condition to restrict outages to the circuit or equipment affected. We just talked about this right here in that previous slide. Right? When I have a fault, I want the breaker closest to the device to open. Now, it says accomplished by the selection of overcurrent protective devices and their ratings or settings for the full range of available overcurrents. This second sentence here, you're going to have to select the overcurrent protective devices. That selection process 
outside of the ratings. Obviously, I have to know my fault current to make sure that I have the right interrupting rating. I have to know my voltage to make sure that I applied uh, the product at the right voltage levels that per its ratings. But I will use the time current characteristic curves to select the right device that achieves my goal, that opens before the upstream devices, or holds its contacts closed to let the downstream devices trip. And that evaluation is what we're going to talk about. And, and, and the, the, the next sentence in this definition talks about from overload to the available fault current. Now, the important part to understand is that we, when you evaluate two overcurrent devices or three overcurrent devices or more that are in series, they're all going to see pretty much the same fault current. And I say pretty much because you may have motor contribution. Some downstream devices may see a little bit more than upstream devices because of motor contribution. But suffice it to say, you need to evaluate the performance of all of those devices with regard to current. Now, um, and, 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 and we're gonna talk about that as we move forward and when that evaluation and the time current characteristic curve uh, basically fails to give you the information you need to understand how to solve the problem or whether or not things will coordinate. Uh, so you need to make sure that you evaluate uh, the the performance of these devices based upon all of the currents. And we're going to, by the, by the end of this two hours, you're going to completely understand that. I'm trusting. That's my job. That's my goal. Here is to help you understand that these devices respond to current and when I can use the time current characteristic curve and when I need to resort to tables. So this is an example. This is out of an IEEE standard 242. Uh, for recommended practice for protection and coordination of industrial commercial power systems. I believe that's the buff book, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, and what they're, what they're demonstrating in this diagram, you'll notice that you have two devices that are overlapping in this region. And as long as my fault, if my fault current lies anywhere in this area, so if my fault current is here that these two breakers will see, then I would say that both of those devices are going to have are going to open, uh, which would be a lack of selective coordination, and that's basically what the you if you read the text down here on the bottom, uh, it'll tell you that only circuit breaker uh, for for fault currents up to this point here, any of the fault currents that are in this region from zero all the ways up to with the instantaneous pickup, leading edge of that trip curve, you know that that downstream breaker is going to open and the upstream breaker is going to clear is going to uh, hold its contacts closed the moment that your fault currents the moment that your fault currents get into this region so your higher fault currents that are in the instantaneous pickup region of both of those circuit breakers based upon the time current characteristic curves as an engineer i have to make a call to say uh, my my conservative approach would say they're both going to open that may or may not be true because I don't have enough data outside of the TCC curve, and that's where the selective coordination tables come into play. When your fault current goes into the instantaneous region of these two devices, they both see a fault current high enough that you're, you may trip in the instantaneous region. Then I go back and I fall back to use my tables. Um, and, and, and we're going to understand that as again as we move forward. But the goal here is to, is to is to generate and uh, give you separation of curves. That's basically what you're seeing. If my fault current is at this point uh, for these two devices, for this device and this device, then I have a clear delay in time of the upstream device because of that short time delay. My downstream device will trip instantaneously, but my upstream device will hold its context closed and I have separation of my curves Beyond the uh, inst uh, beyond the available short circuit current for the instantaneous region of the upstream device, so I know that I'm not into the instantaneous region for that upstream device. I'm into the short time delay region, and I am 
uh, tripping instantaneously on my downstream breaker. So Joseph, I am going to, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to walk through this and, 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 and we're going to build, keep building on what I'm talking about here as we move through some examples. So we're going to, we're going to get you covered. If I get a little bit further and you still don't understand it, let me know. And, uh, and, and I'll, and I'll, ref and I'll, and I'll go back over it again. Now, I use this as an example uh, for this downstream breaker is uh, this red breaker here is, is our BAB breaker from an Eaton perspective. Uh, m a lot of different manufacturers will have breakers that have a similar curve to this. And one of the big misconceptions that I, that I see is when I show this curve, and this is, this is on my past quizzes, and I was going to send out a quiz on this again, but I decided not to. I'll just talk about it. A lot of people will look at this trip, these two trip curves and say, wow, that is great selective coordination. But what they're not realizing is I'm not plotting the available short circuit current. So if my short circuit current is say, so, so how I read this curve is this is a thousand amps because it's, it's, you always have to, you always have to look at the bottom of this, of this, uh, of this TCC curve. I'm at current in amps times one. So I know that these are in, this is a hundred amps. This is a thousand amps. This is 10,000 amps, right? If I, if both of these devices see 10,000 amps of current, so if this is my fault current, so I apologize for the squiggly lines there. If that's my fault current, my 20 amp breaker is going to trip instantaneously faster than 0.01 seconds. My 150 amp F-150 breaker, F-150, the breaker, not the truck, will, will take at its longest time, a little less, let's say 0.015 seconds or 0.014, somewhere in that ballpark uh, as the longest cling time. The reason we have a band is because it can trip anywhere. So this breaker can trip anywhere from, from, the, from 0. 0.0004 seconds or 0. 0.0001 seconds all the way up to 0. 0.014 seconds, right? I don't know. It's a band, and it'll depend upon every device will be different on how fast it responds. So all I know is that I am into the instantaneous region of both of these circuit breakers, and they both well, pro if I have 10,000 amps, I can tell you based upon the tables, and we're going to review that, that they will both open. Um, so from a coordination perspective, if my fault current was, if my fault current is in zone two, any fault current that is into the instantaneous region of that upstream F-150 circuit breaker, I have to make an assumption as an engineer that they're probably both going to open with no other data available to me. Now, to solve that problem, I've got a couple options. I can, if I wanted to solve this problem, I could take this F-150 and make it a larger circuit breaker, which would move the instantaneous to the right. Or I could, if it would be possible, to, uh, to add a transformer in here, I could knock the fault current down to where it could be uh, either at that level or at this level. I mean, I could knock that fault current down to a very low level based upon conductor run or add a one-to-one -one transformer. Anything, anything that I can add impedance or an inductor, that's not typically done, I, although I've seen it done on larger projects where they, that was the only way to solve the problem was to knock the fault current down. They put a one-to-one -one transformer in, uh, and uh, you know a transformer is a is a, a big piece of iron, and uh, they're able to knock the fault currents down to where now they get it to a respectable level, and now they can selectively coordinate to those lower fault current values. But you have to understand where your fault currents are, and that both of those break both of these circuit breakers, what fault current they will both see. So for a fault downstream of that twenty amp circuit breaker, both of those breakers are going to see that fault current. And if that fault current is in zone two, high enough to be in the instantaneous pickup of the upstream device, based upon just the time current characteristic curves, I have to say they do not selectively coordinate. And then I would have to make a 
a design decision. I would have, as an engineer, again, I'm either going to put a larger overcurrent device upstream. I can change this 150 to maybe a 200 or a 250. But what, but what that does is it, it changes, again, remember, I have to protect a conductor at its ampacity. If I put a 250 amp breaker in there, uh, I would have to increase the size of the conductor as well. So as I increase upstream over current devices, I, I get into a race where I, I increase the conductor size, which decreases the fault current, which increases, or which decreases the impedance, which increases the fault current. Uh, so Joseph's asking, let's say you increase the size of the upstream breaker to achieve selective coordination. How would you protect the conductor? You've got to put a larger conductor, right? Um, uh, so if I, if I would change that 150 amp breaker to a 200 amps, I can't have 150 amps worth of, of, of conductor. I've got to put a larger conductor. And if I have a larger conductor, that's going to be a lower impedance. It's going to increase the fault current a little bit more. But you'll get to a point where your instantaneous is farther enough to the right and you have enough time delay no matter what you do and you will selectively coordinate. Or I can use the selective coordination circuit breaker tables. And what those are, basically, we took uh, two circuit breakers and we tested them in the lab. We put them in series with each other. Basically, we're using UL489 um, series rating test configuration from UL489. This is how we do it. Uh, other manufacturers may just base it on up over uh, using the uh, let through curves of their of their technologies and circuit breakers if that if that information is available. Um, some people again, some people use the let through capabilities and the curves to do an analysis, uh, and 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 uh, some people will do testing. We do a lot of testing, a lot more testing than the than the analysis. I think uh, that really is, uh, it shows you the performance of the overcurrent devices in, in a real world type of application from a, you're injecting the high fault currents and you're watching them perform. So what this table shows you is on the left-hand side, for our tables on the left-hand side is our load side breaker. Across the top is the line side breaker. That is not standardized. If you're looking at other manufacturers' tables, even fuse manufacturers, that may be flipped. The, they got it backwards, in my opinion. The line side breaker is down the left-hand side of the, of the, of the uh, paper, and the load side breaker is across the top. So you've got to make sure you read the table information to know how the pairs of devices are configured. In this case, across the top is the line side breaker. Down the left-hand side is the uh, downstream breaker or the load side breaker. And you'll notice we have the catalog numbers here. We have the amp rating size of those devices here. Uh, we also have on the line side, we have the catalog number, uh, not the catalog, well, yeah, with sort of, the, we have the frame rating. Uh, you have whether or not it's a, a thermal magnetic, the T slash M is short for saying thermal magnetic. The ETU is electronic trip unit. Now I will tell you, that as you get into selective coordination, you'll recognize you have much more flexibility when you're using an electronic trip unit for a lot of different reasons. In a thermomagnetic circuit breaker, I'm controlling the instantaneous pickup in a mechanical way, right? I, I'm either, I'm either uh, causing a, a uh, I call it the clapper, but a, a latch to pull in, or I'm causing a plunger to push out or pull in to trip the circuit breaker. And that's a mechanical device. It's, it's, it's relying on magnetic energy. Uh, it's, re it's relying on the materials and, and whatnot. And the bands can get fat uh, from, a, from a error margin on those time current characteristic curves. When I'm using an electronic trip unit, I have sensors in there that sense the amount of current that's flowing. I've got a microprocessor that lets me create curves that are much more uh, tighter in tolerance. And because I'm pairing electronic trip unit with what I know in my mechanical capabilities of that device, I can hold those, I can be more accurate in how long uh, for what currents I let those contacts hold closed to where I don't get chatter, 
right? I don't want chatter in a circuit breaker. I want those things to open. So we force that open and we know what that chatter point is. We know what the capabilities of that circuit breaker are and we will tell that thing to open before any damage could possibly happen to those contacts inside or the device itself. But I can push that instantaneous out a little bit further and add some time delays because I have a microprocessor brain. But once I get in the instantaneous region, I'm into these tables. So that's what the ETU at the top is, electronic trip unit, and TM is thermal magnetic. You'll see a minimum and maximum trip. Some breakers, like this one here, the min and max is 125. You know what that means? That's a 125 amp breaker. It's a thermal magnetic circuit breaker. You can't get anything done other than 125 amps through that. You see that in your residential breakers, your 15, 20 amp circuit breakers. If you want to, if you have a 15 amp breaker and you want to get a 20 amps out of it, you got to change the breaker. These are just your larger molded case circuit breakers at 125 or 400 amps or whatever that, that current rating is. Um, so those are, and you'll see the frames, F frame, uh, and we're changing our frames right now. We're coming out with a new line of breakers. So all of that's going to change. I'm going to check to update all my PowerPoint slides. But when you see an electronic trip unit, the moment you have the flexibility to have an 80 amp frame and a down to a 15 amp trip, that means that I can adjust the long time pickup of this device. It's an 80 amp breaker. I can set it for 80 amps and I can protect 80 amps worth of conductor. Or I can have an 80 amp frame and dial it down to 15 amps. Why would you wanna do that? Because the 80 amp instantaneous is further to the right than a 15 amp circuit breaker's instantaneous. If you assume 10 times on the instantaneous pickup, a 15 amp breaker will pick up at 150 amps. An 80 amp breaker will pick up at 800 amps. So if, if we assume 10 times the long time rating for the instantaneous pickup. So, I can get 800 amps of an instantaneous pickup on a 15 amp circuit if that's what I need because the fault currents are higher and for selective coordination purposes. These tables, uh, Joseph, I appreciate the, uh, the question. Joseph asks, uh, are the coordination table manufa tables manufacturer specific? Yes, they are. Uh, as you're looking at this table, I'm showing you a BAB, a BR, downstream of an F-frame uh, F-150 as an example. Uh, so our previous example was an F-150, which is right here, and a BAB 20 or 30 or whatever what it is. Those are my breakers. I'm not testing my breakers with squared ease breakers, with Siemens breakers, with anybody else's circuit breaker. And the reason is, if I change my breakers, I know I need to change my, my selective coordination tables. If another manufacturer changes their tables or their breakers, that could impact my tables. I may not even know about the design change. There's no communication between myself and them. This is not driven by a UL standard. It's not driven by an ANSI standard process. This is manufacturers testing their devices together to establish these data points right in here. That's the meat of this table. And what this what these data points tell you is that when I have an F this upstream breaker, an F-150, upstream of a BAB or a BR or anything that's in this uh, uh, in these catalog numbers, from a 15 amp to a 70 amp, I selectively coordinate up to 1500 amps. That's what 1.5 is, is 1,500 or 1,500 amps. So I selectively coordinate up to 1,500 amps. If I put anything more than 1,500 amps through that pair of breakers, that 150 amp breaker upstream, and that uh, 15 amp through uh, 70 amp breaker downstream, BAB or, or BR or HQP or the QC, any of those catalog number breakers downstream, that pair, I put... 2,000 amps through them, they're both going to open. I put 10,000 amps through them, they're both going to open. So if I go back to our example, which I had the F-150 uh, upstream of a BAB-20, anything greater than 1,500 amps, I am going to open both of those circuit breakers. So these two trip curves, if, if my fault current was 1,000 amps, 
I would know, even though that 1,000 amps is into the instantaneous region of that F-150 circuit breaker, even though it is into that region, and I would probably, without the tables, have to say I need to bump that breaker up or reduce my fault current, I know because of the tables I coordinate up to 1,500 amps. Anything 1,500 amps and less, I am going to have selective coordination. So I'm using the tables to say, this is actually okay. If I was doing this for a client, a customer of mine, I would plot this. I would, uh, I would plot my fold current and I would put a note and I would say, note that based upon the time current characteristic curve, I do not selectively coordinate, but because I use the tables and I would put those tables in with my report, I'm, I'm telling the customer that they do selectively coordinate because of the manufacturer's information, which gives you extended information about the performance of these two breakers based upon higher fault currents uh, that extends beyond what the TCC curve is, uh, is telling us. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, if I have 2000 amps or I have more, then I know both of those circuit breakers are gonna open. I know I need to do something at that point. I really need to do something. If I had 2,000 amps or if I had 10,000 amps flowing through both of these, I could, and, I, and my goal was selective coordination, whether it be a code requirement or a design goal from my customer, I would have to say, I need to address this situation. And how do you address that? You put a larger breaker in upstream. Or you could change the downstream to be a faster device. If you could find another downstream device that performs better from a coordination perspective, and what Eaton has done since we have a Busman solution, you know, Eaton has acquired Cooper back a few years ago. Oh, quite a few years ago now. It's getting up. I'm getting older. Um, we acquired our, our, our Fuse uh, guys, and we tested our mode decay circuit breakers upstream of our um, TCF fuses and our, our quick spec panel, basically. And what this shows you is, that that F-150, remember that F-150 that, that, that was in a, um, it selectively coordinated up to 1,500 amps with the BAB 20 or 30 up, whatever, downstream up to 70 amps. I will selectively coordinate up to 35,000 amps in this case because my downstream device is so fast that that upstream circuit breaker doesn't even know it, that that fault occurred it does not open, will not open up to the interrupting rating, which is what that 35,000 amps is of those circuit breakers. We've have, we have an extensive uh, table of circuit breaker and fuses. And what that gets you, this is a plot of those two curves. That lets me uh, put keep that F-150 and not bump that up to a 200 or a 250 amp, depending upon, or put an electronic trip unit. When I add electronic trip units, I'm adding cost. When I add a larger breaker, I'm not only increasing the price of the circuit breaker, I could be increasing the panel board as well. So uh, here is uh, another thing to remember. Uh, and, and, and I, I've, uh, we, we have, I, have a, I have a spreadsheet and we have an extended table in our consulting application guide, which has the additional information that I wasn't showing on my previous uh, tables because it just, it just makes the screen way too busy. But you see this data here, a power line. This is, a power, power line is our panel boards. And you'll notice that I have main, branch, and subfeed. And what that means is I have a main inside of a panel board, I have a branch inside of a panel board, or I could have a subfeed coming out the bottom of that panel board. So there are three locations you can put a circuit breaker inside of a panel board. Now, not all circuit breakers fit in all enclosures. So as you're going through the selective coordination process and you're using, if you get into using the tables or even if you don't use the tables, no matter what, when you're selecting a circuit breaker, you have to understand where in a panel board that breaker is going. Is it going to be the main in the panel board? Like in... Uh, in the case of, of uh, in the case of, of this, I show a bar here, and I show a breaker here and a breaker there. You would make an assumption without any other information. At least I would make the assumption that that's in an enclosure together. That that F one hundred and fifty is the main, and the BAB twenty 
is a branch or a feeder down uh, in that same panel board. Uh, it could be that that F-150 is actually in an upstream panel board as a feeder, and that's a main lug only panel. And there's a conductor in between that F-150 and that BAB-20, right? Your one line diagram is gonna be critical to help you understand that. But uh, the, the, the other thing you have to remember is that I can't put all of my breakers in every spot inside that panel board. So for example, let's take this EGB thermomagnetic 125 amp breaker. It fits in our power line panel, 3E panel as a main or a branch. You cannot put that EGB breaker in a power line 2A or a 3A or a four or a five. You can't put that breaker into those other panel boards. You have to buy the 3E panel board. If you were picking a circuit breaker as a branch device, then that was going to be your main. Say you're, you were going to have a 125 amp panel. You're going to have an EGB 125 and you're going to have an FD 15 amp circuit breaker. I can't put the FD breaker in a 3E panel board. Okay, that's, that's not unique to Eaton. That's the same for all manufacturers. You have to think about what breakers you're picking and where they can go in a panel board. So what we've done with our circuit breaker tables is we've provided more information on our tables to tell you where those breakers can go into the equipment so that you pick the right breakers for those um, for that application that's going to go in that specific location. Now, we have I'm not going to talk about the tools we have. We have web-based tools that will help you uh, make it a lot easier for you. So you don't have to think about what breakers can go into what positions. We have a selective coordinator um, online tool that will give you that. I'm giving you the, um, you know, as engineers, as electrical engineers or mechanical engineers, when you get into engineering, you're solving, right? So what do they tell you? If you don't understand the equation, derive it. Well, I'm helping you understand the derivation of those software applications that will help you pick the breakers. SKM systems analysis and those types of tools do not tell you whether or not it will go into that panel board. You've got to rely on the manufacturer's information for that and be educated on what you can put where. And that's where our application engineers and our field sales offices come into play. They can look at your design and tell you whether or not it'll actually be buildable. Okay, we can uh, we can come up with a lot of designs that you actually cannot buy equipment to uh, to meet your goals. So it's very important in the design phase to get these details out of the way. But this, I look at this, uh, this, this fuse and breaker pair as a problem solver, possibly, to help you achieve your goals without increasing the overcurrent devices upstream. It's a, it's, it can make a world of difference for you. All right, so now I'm going to run through an example. Uh, before I get into this example, I'm going to take a look at... Um, I'm going to take a quick look at my chat sessions. I haven't been looking at uh, at chat at all. Let's take a look at the, uh, the tubers out there. Uh, it's great. We got a good healthy line. We got a hundred about 140 people online watching. I have a healthy stream. Okay, so let's take a look at. Um, hello, Thomas. Glad to be here. Warm regards. Excellent. Good to see you. We got Sergio, we got Lorenzo, Adam, awesome, from Mason, Ohio. Thanks for joining us. We got Matt Braun. Uh, the sign-in was uh, 1969-42. So if you didn't get that, 1969-42. and 42. So sign-in is 1969-42. and 42. Love that. I don't have my SKM open right now, but do the tables supersede the curves? Uh, for instance, would the instantaneous region for the BAB breaker overlap the F-frame? Ah, all right. So uh, that's a good question, Ryan. So remember, in that curve that I showed you, in this curve, the BAB breaker is instantaneous. So the question is, uh, this this is plotted, this, this, this pair of curves is plotted in SKM. And your question is, would the instantaneous region of the BAB breaker overlap the F 
frame breaker on the curve. And the question is on the curve, no. There's no overlap all the way down to 0 0.017, 0 0.01 seconds. And a lot of engineers will say, that selectively coordinates. I, and, and the reason I use this example, I had a very good uh, engineer send an email and said, wow, Tom, I love your BAB breaker down a, downstream of an F-150. The selective coordination that I get out of these two breakers is awesome. And thank you. And I responded back. I said, really glad we can help, but uh, what's your fault current? And then I got a phone call from him. And he says, um, he says to me, he says, uh, what do you mean fault current? I said, well, what fault current will both of these devices see? He goes, well, I don't have no overlap of the instantaneous all the way down to 0.01 seconds, 0.017. And, and he went through and said, look, look at all this separation. Look at this space. It's beautiful space. I have no problem with selective coordination all the way down to 0.01 seconds. And, and he said, I have no overlap of curves. And that's true. But I asked him, I says, what do you think both of those breakers are going to see do when they see 10,000 amps? And he says, the downstream breaker is going to hold closed, and the upstream breaker, the F-150, is going to, uh, is going, or the downstream breaker is going to trip, and the upstream breaker is going to hold closed, based on the TCC curve. I said, no. Based on the TCC curve, you are still above the instantaneous pickup of both of those devices. And this is not only, there is one manufacturer out there, which I'm not going to drag anybody through the mud, but there is one manufacturer out there. If you want to send me an email, I'll tell you over email, but I'm not going to say it on YouTube or on Facebook or on WebEx. There is one manufacturer out there who made their selective coordination tables in this manner, and they'll, say, they'll tell you that, that these two breakers selectively coordinate up to the interrupting break rating of both of them, the, of the lowest interrupting rating breaker uh, out of both of those pairs. And that is 100% wrong, okay? because they're reading the TCC curve. Now, if they, if, if they would test those, then what we tested, that F-150 upstream of that BAB all the way up to a 70 amps, I know for a fact, for a fact, that those breakers will open, both of them will open, once you get above 1,500 amps. All right? So that is a, a, a and you got to be careful, even, I mean, the manufacturer, and, and I haven't reached out to them yet, um, I, I, it creates an issue with um, it creates an issue when you're bidding projects because that manufacturer will bid a project using using uh, this TCC curve and say, look, I, I can selectively coordinate up to the interrupting rating of these two devices, and in reality, it does not work that way. And their literature says that, but it's technically incorrect. That's why I say, ask them for their tested data. Did they test those two devices? I can tell you that our curves, our tables are tested pairs. Uh, we we're not doing the uh, we're not doing let throughs and even if they even if they did let through which which is fine. I mean, it's a valid process to look at the let through of the upstream device and the and and the capability of the downstream device um, and 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 come up with that determination, but ask for it. Um all right. So I'm looking at the questions before we get into this. Uh, Bill Knight so allows engineering supervision in existing installations that could allow the engineer to design the different manufacturers. Uh, yeah, so so you could, here's the thing, uh, Bill, uh, when you're using different manufacturers, parts and pieces, you're going to be on the TCC curve. I mean, that's what you have. That's the only tool you have is a time current characteristic curve. If you wanted to run a test in a lab, you could do that. You can do what we did. You know, grab UL-489 test configuration, shoot those breakers in a lab. You can even tell us, hey, I want you to shoot these in a lab and, and bring that in a lab and we'll, we'll, we'll do that uh, pairs for you. And um, we'll tell you what the capabilities are between manufacturers for your specific application. But I won't publish anything, All right? We've had, we've done some custom testing for some very large customers who, uh, who wanted to, to prove out their design. It's expensive. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to lie. It's not cheap to uh, run a lab and get a test done. But if you have a, a customer as big as some of those that we deal with, uh, it's a drop in the bucket and it solves a design problem and it makes sense for them. Uh, but there's no real way to engineer those uh, unless, and, and now you could do 
uh, let throughs. If you had current limiting devices, uh, you can try to do a, a, let, a current let through evaluation. But these thermomagnetic breakers so that are not current limiting or not listed as current limiting devices, you're not going to get the data you need to do a let through evaluation. There is an IEEE paper that um, I believe it was Marcelo Valdez did with um, a fuse manufacturer. It wasn't us. Uh, so there was a another breaker manufacturer and another fuse manufacturer that did an IEEE paper. And I believe they delivered it in uh, the electrical safety workshop where they did this analysis. If you're interested in that, I can send you the title for that. And maybe what I'll do is I'll, I got to do a better job at providing links below these uh, uh, YouTube presentations, but I'll, I'll put those links down below my YouTube presentation. Uh, the biggest complaint from code enforcement officials reviewing TCCs is when the design engineer does not show the available fault current for the, that's exactly right. So here's Bill, here's what you do. In my opinion, this is what, if I was an electrical inspector, you're not going to be looking at these curves and saying, and, and whether or not they selectively coordinate. It's, it, I know some really good engineers who don't understand these time, time current characteristic curves. I know a lot of engineers who will look at these, that circuit breaker pair and say they selectively coordinate without going to the tables, without understanding that the, when the fault current goes in the instantaneous region of both of those devices, that you don't have coordination. Okay, and that's not, I wouldn't feel bad if I, if, if you're in that, if somebody on this line is in that ballpark, I don't, I wouldn't feel bad. I know some very good engineers who just don't understand that and that's fine. But if you're on this, if you're on YouTube or if you're on Facebook or if you're on WebEx, you don't have that excuse anymore. You understand that now. Um, so Ryan, hopefully I answered your question. Bill, I, hopefully I got your question. Uh, but but what, I, what I would do, Bill, is I would have the engineer Go on record as saying, this is, take the definition out of the National Electrical Code. If it's an Article 700, 701, or 708, because an inspector is going to be inspecting to the code, they can go for selective coordination on the normal side. They can go for selective coordination where it's not required by the code. You're not going to be looking for it. But if it's required by the code, get the engineer of record on record in his signature with the definition to say, he will design the system to meet this. He is going to stamp it with his PE stamp. He's going to stamp the drawing, stamp the design. I think, in my opinion, the electrical inspector would be a rare breed to look at a selective coordination study and really understand it to know whether or not they've met the National Electrical Code requirements. If you get the engineer to sign off on that ahead of time, even if you think you're the sharpest knife in the drawer and you know selective coordination, uh, because you've attended one of Dan Neeser's class or or Joe Shoemaker's classes or one of my classes on selective coordination, uh, and, and you think you're the guru, that's fine. But get the engineer of record to understand that up front, that that's what uh, they need to meet. Um, all right, so I'm looking through. Uh, Ron, uh, Ryan, what's the point of using software like SKM then if an engineer doing their analysis has to go back and check all of these tables. Ryan, the only time you're going to have to check these tables is when your fault current is high enough to be the, in the instantaneous region. And, and even if it is, even if it is high enough to be in the instantaneous region, you still need to plot those curves for the long time region. Because remember, on some of these electronic trip units, on pretty much on a lot of electronic trip units, if it's electronic trip unit, that long time pickup, that short time delay, all of those values, all of those uh, parameters are going to be adjustable in the field. And you will have to plot those curves to make sure you don't have overlap in the long time region or the short time region of those time current characteristic curves. So, from a, so your question is, what's the point of using that software? The point is that you need to look at coordination for all currents in the long time region as well. <laughs> yes, and Joe Pavia's classes as well. I could go on and on. They, you know, Eaton's got a lot of great guys and uh, that do uh, these coordination studies and, and education. So in any case, uh, Ryan, that's that's what I would say is your point is you have to worry about the long time region as well as the short time region. Um, I'll just give you an example uh, from a selective coordination perspective in SKM. I'm just gonna do a test uh, plot for you. 
if I um, add, say I add a static trip uh, circuit breaker, and I go to, uh, I'm gonna make the bus voltage for 80, and I go to the library, and I pick, I go to the library and I pick, uh, Any one of these Cutler Hammer, remember Eaton has Cutler Hammer. We leave these in there because of brand and uh, brand recognition and, and whatnot, but we're slowly uh, putting in our, our breakers uh, as, as an Eaton uh, perspective as well. So you have our legacy breakers and our newer breakers in here as well. So let's say I have a, uh, I don't know, a 1600 amp. This is a 2500 amp frame, adjustable down to 1600 amps. Um, I can move... Oh boy, hold on. Oh, that's a fixed. That's fixed. So let's go back. Go back to my library. That's fixed. That's an IEC breaker. Um, I don't know. It's just I'm just picking something for Sorry about that loud ding. I know it's a much louder, I think. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Woo. All right. Um all right, so so here you go. So and there's my instantaneous region on this circuit breaker. I have the ability to move my short time delay. I can move my short time delay pickup. I can move my uh, short time delay up and down. I can move my long time pickup left and right. So if my fault current is high enough and it's in the instantaneous region of this breaker, yes, I can use the tables to help bail me out of a hard uh, problem. But I will still need to make sure that my I don't have overlap in this long time region uh, or short time delay region of these circuit breakers. All right. So, uh, and my short time delay is fixed on this one as well. So these devices will be programmable in the field, and they're settable in the field. And I will have to coordinate in those long time regions. What I'm confused, I looked up division, uh, you know the game and saw this. I'm not sure. I'm going to just hide you. I'll hide you. Sorry about that feeling. Uh, all right. So, Ryan, hopefully I answered your question. Uh, Mel, you are welcome, sir. I'm here to help. Felix? Good to see you, Felix. All right. So I think that's all the questions on YouTube. Let me check uh, Facebook a little bit. All right, we've got Jim Bowen. Awesome. We've got Jim Bowen, Larry Air out there as well, Tim Norman, uh, and Dominic. I don't see any questions coming in on Facebook. So, all righty, let me look on Tom. Okay, so let me look at the chat on WebEx. I have a question according to Article 517.31G. It says that uh, coordination is required only for faults that exceed 0.1 seconds in duration. What does this mean? You know, that's a good question. Well, I don't know if I have my 0.1 second. So I, don't, I don't think I did. Since we're talking selective coordination here, what you're talking about in 517 is not selective coordination. 517 is what we call coordination. And in Article 517, what they did was they, <clears throat> they basically are ignoring fault current and only looking for separation of curves beyond 0.1 seconds. So let me see if I have a, um, let me see if I have a good uh, example of that. Let me do this one. So remember this curve here. What, uh, what they've done is, and let's say that this right here, let's say for example, uh, -bum, I got my pen highlighted. Let's say that this is 0.1 seconds, and I have a clear overlap of curves right here, right? What, uh, what they're doing is, if this is 0.1 seconds, for, for coordination in a, in a healthcare environment, you basically draw that line, you ignore everything below the line. I call that the handy-dandy coordination tool. You ignore everything over there. If your fault current is over here, you ignore that too. Ignore the fault current, and you're only looking for separation in that region. 
that's what coordination is based on the healthcare um, requirements in Article 517 and in uh, NFPA 99. I don't know if that if I did that justice, maybe I'll do a, a class just on coordination. And what I'm talking about in this case here is I'm just ta talking about selective coordination, which is not 517.31. If you do what I'm going to show you how to do, then you are exceeding the requirements in Article 517. Uh, Kevin Ryan says, that means you don't have to fully selectively coordinate only on part of the plot. Yes, he was answering your question. Yep. For a long time, they pushed it for healthcare facilities. They haven't had any issues with this requirement of full selective coordination in hospitals is very difficult. Uh, it, it can be a challenge. Um, but uh, if you talk to your maintenance people, which I've done a lot of presentations with healthcare in, in the healthcare world as well, with talking with maintenance people, go down to, uh, to some of your customers, ask them about... Uh, any, any types of cascading events, it, it occurs. I never understood why that in one, in one of the most critical occupancies, they don't require sexual credit. I, I'm not here to debate that for you guys. I'm just here to help you understand it. So I'm gonna get back to uh, the program, a regularly scheduled program. We're going to do an example and I'm gonna do an example around. So I've already showed you an example of a BAB downstream of an F-150. That's two circuit breakers in series. You're going to use the tables just like I showed you. And if you didn't get that, go back, scroll back uh, in your videos. Uh, this, again, this is going to be on YouTube. So I'm going to show you around a transformer because a lot of people don't understand this. I have an example, 75 kVA transformer, 480 volt primary, a 280 volt secondary, 3.61% transformer impedance. We're going to select all of the circuit breakers in this application, primary and secondary, uh, and those branch breakers so that they selectively coordinate and meet the code requirements in Article 450. Now, if you look in 450, um, I want to make sure that I'm on time. So I've only, it's, I started at 1130 and it's 1230 now. So I, I still got an hour. So this is good. This is good. Maybe I'll have time to go over the coordination. All right, so based on the tables in four, in Article 450, I know everybody has their code book uh, out and they're looking in 450 on uh, uh, table 450.3b. Okay. four fifty dot three b, which is our table. And 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 it's remember this this table. And I go to 450.3a, uh, b, because the a is transformers over 1,000 volts, and b is less than 1,000 volts. And if you were in the transformer class, you're going to remember, medium voltage is the second, as everywhere else in the code book. Medium voltage is first in this case, and the lower voltage is second. So this tells us that if I'm doing primary and secondary protection, and I'm not going to get into the details of when you can do one or the other. That's a YouTube video that I have where you can look on transformers and I talk about uh, when you can do no secondary protection. But suffice it to say, you are going to more often than not have the secondary overcurrent device. So if I'm doing primary and secondary, my primary overcurrent device can be sized up to 250%. Now remember, I can't go to, the, if I'm if I'm sizing it that large, if I calculate 250% of the full load amps on the primary, I can't go to the next higher overcurrent protective device. If you don't understand that one, go again, go look at the transformer video. Uh, so I can't go to the next higher device, I have to go to the next lower device. Um, that's the maximum size overcurrent that I can go on the primary. The lowest, in a, uh, the lowest is going to be determined based upon the inrush. The smallest device is gonna be determined on, based on the inrush current of the transformer and in our case, selective coordination. Uh, the secondary device is at 125%. Uh, secondary is maximum can be 125%. So 125% uh, of, in this case, 208.18 amps. So if you do the math, you have a maximum of a 260 amp. So I could put a 250 amp panel board downstream of this. I can put a 200 amp panel board. I can put a 100 amp panel board downstream. I just can't put a 400 amp panel board downstream of this transformer. And on the primary, my maximum is 225 amps. Uh, so I will not have a feeder 
larger than 225 amps feeding this transformer. All right, so when the first thing you want to do is figure out what the available fault current is that you're going to need to selectively coordinate to because you can't evaluate uh, the overcurrent protective devices without understanding uh, what current value you need to selectively coordinate to. Now, if you think about, um, you know, I'm, uh, Kevin, I'm looking at your chat. Selective coordination can create problems as engineers will remove breakers from the system to allow selective coordination. It makes the maintenance more difficult. I would argue that selective coordination is probably the least of your worries if you're changing breakers and you're not thinking about arc flash or other characteristics and other capabilities of possible design goals. Selective coordination is only one design goal. Uh, changing circuit breakers out, you've got the interrupting ratings, you've got the voltage, you've got arc flash incident energy, uh, depending upon what breaker you're putting in to take it out. You have selective coordination, whether you are coordinating in the overload region only, even in a 0.1 seconds. I could have a coordination issue if I'm not plotting that curve and replacing that even in a healthcare environment. So unfortunately, in those environments, nobody's thinking about it. And they think, well, because of 0.1 seconds, I've got all my problems solved. That is not true. Um, you have to really understand uh, the time current characteristic curves of your overcurrent device that you're replacing, even in the long-term time region. Short time delay, long time pickups, long time delays, all of that is adjustable as I just showed on, uh, on, on my SKM systems analysis. So you have to understand your fault current. Now, some engineers will say, uh, three-phase bolted fault doesn't occur. Fine, pick another fault current. Pick the ground fault current. Pick the arcing fault current. Pick some fault current value. If it's not an Article 700 system, or a 701 or 708, you don't have to selectively coordinate to the three-phase bolted fault. Pick something. To ignore fault current, you're not doing yourself um, a justice. I got you, Kevin. Sorry about that. All right, so the worst case scenario is the infinite bus available fault current on the secondary of this transformer. In this case, it's 5,767. Uh, the equation for calculating the infinite bus, and if you want to understand what the infinite bus is, go back to one of my other YouTube uh, videos. I'll put some links down below. Um, but in any case, I calculate the maximum that I could possibly see on the secondary of that transformer with that impedance. Anything we pick in this case is going to be based upon this transformer and this impedance. You change the transformer out. If you're in the design phase, for example, and the transformer you get in has a lower impedance then what you used in your design, you may not selectively coordinate or even coordinate for all that matters at whatever fault current value you picked because the values are going to be uh, different. So my, my, my guidance would be uh, make sure you're, you know, you're choosing, if you choose the worst case, yes, it could put you into a larger uh, um, trip curve perspective a larger breaker where you may not need it, but you can always make those modifications during the as-built phase or during the, um, after you get that transformer in place, go back, check your studies and make sure that you, and if you want to make an adjustment at that point, you can because you have a transformer now and you know what the impedance is. So in this case, the uh, secondary fault current is 5,767 amps. And we're gonna to have to make sure that our devices uh, and some devices in this have to coordinate up to 5,767 amps. Now, uh, selective coordination on the secondary, I have to make sure that my feeder or branch breakers, that is your devices B1 through B4, selectively coordinate with your main B5, uh, because if they see that fault, they need to, um, they need to, uh, to be able to, uh, to selectively coordinate. Now, if your fault is further downstream, you could make some assumptions in your design. You could say, look, I'm going to assume, you know, 10 feet of conductor uh, on the secondary of this and, uh, and, and use a lower fault current value. You could do that as long as it's not an Article 700 type of system. There's a lot of things you can do from a design engineering perspective when you have the flexibility outside of a code requirement. Uh, so in any case, those two breakers, that B1, what you do is you pick the largest downstream breaker in this example. You'll pick either 
B1 through B4, whichever one is larger, and B1 and B4 are 20, and the other twos are 15, so you pick the 20 amp breaker, as long as there's no 30 amp breakers in there. You pick the 20 amp circuit breaker, and you know that your main has to selectively coordinate with that 20 amp breaker. And you do the evaluation. So I have uh, 5,000 and some amps, and I have to selectively coordinate those two devices. Now, in this case, I'm going straight to the selective coordination tables because at 5,000 amps, at a circuit breaker that, um, if, if it's a 250 amp uh, uh, panel board, I know that I'm probably going to be using these, uh, these tables to get a more cost-effective solution. So this is our table. Remember I showed you, I told you during the, uh, during this last discussion, this is the added information that we put in our, uh, I'm sorry, not that, not that one down here. That's the added information and over, over in this ballpark over here. Okay, I don't care if you're doing 0.1 seconds or if you're doing selective coordination, you, you gotta be careful, or, or if you're not even achieving any of those goals, you don't give two hoots uh, whether or not they both open. You're gonna need to make sure you have pick breakers that fit in the panel board that you're going for. Uh, so what you're showing here is that, uh, for example, that F frame, uh, these, these circuit breakers here, you'll notice that they don't fit as a main in the uh, power line three, uh, the power line, or any of our power line panel boards. So I can't put an 80 amp uh, FD breaker or a 160 amp frame electronic trip unit as a main in those panel boards. And that, again, this that type of concern is not unique to Eaton. It's anybody's breakers in, in panel board configurations, right? So uh, if I walk through this, I know that my minimum trip cannot be greater than 260 amps because if it's greater than 260 amps, that's the maximum size of that, uh, of that upstream, that main device in that panel board. I can't go greater than 260 amps. So if my main breaker lowest pickup setting is greater than 260, it doesn't meet uh, my criteria in article 450 for transformer uh, size of that device, that secondary overcurrent device, 125%. And I know that I have to pick a 20 amp breaker that selectively coordinates up to 5,767 amps. Now, how I use and how I navigate this table is I will work my way over until I find a number. So I got to look in the body of this table for that line item of a 20 amp breaker for a number greater than 5,767. None of those will work. I can't use any of these F-frame breakers above uh, that are that that are sized, you know, large enough. They they don't have a long short long time pickup greater than 260, but none of these values are greater than 5.767. Because remember, all of these numbers are in kiloamps. Okay, so I can't use any of those. So what do I do is I go, I go to the next frame. I go to the K-frame breakers, and I do the same thing. Uh, I have to do the evaluation, so I know that I can't use that because it's a 400-amp frame, 400-amp trip KD breaker, uh, K-frame breaker. It's a thermal magnetic circuit breaker at 400 amps. I can't use it because it exceeds the 260 amps. So I know right off the bat I can't use that. The next thing I have to do is I have to look in this table for a number greater than 5,000. 767 and I know I can't use this column that's out all of these that's not good because that's 2,000 amps 2,000 amps 2,000 amps 2,000 this is only 4,000 amps 2,500 amps now I'm into 5,000 amps and there she blows right here I can use this k-frame breaker with an electronic trip unit it can be dialed down to 160 amps. Uh, it can be go up as high as 400 amps. It can fit in these panel boards as, and, and if I'm looking at a main, because that's what this is, is a main, 
I can put it in a 1A, a 2A, a 3A, or a 3E as a main overcurrent protective device. So I can pick any one of those panels. The 1A is less expensive than a 2A. The 2A is less expensive than a 3A and on. So um, that is the, uh, that's the device that I'm going to pick. And for this application in that spot and that secondary, that uh, secondary device is, um, is a, our new designation is a PD2. Uh, so our, our, our new uh, power defense circuit breakers came out or coming out or came out, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but that's a PD2 trip unit circuit breaker with a 400 amp frame, 250 amp trip. That panel board's a 250 amp panel board. I can use a Powerline 1A uh, because I'm only using a BAB uh, breakers and that'll fit in a Powerline uh, 1A if I wanted to use it that way. I have to look at the voltage. I, it's a 208 volt. I got to look at the panel rating of the voltage. And uh, uh, I believe the Powerline 1A is not 208 volts. I gotta, I, I'm, I'd have to look and see but I have to pick the panel that has the right voltage rating uh, that'll fit that as the main. I can, and, and any one of those will work. So it's a very versatile breaker that fits in any one of those panels. So now I've picked the BAB. I know this is a BAB20. I know that this is my, my main is a PD2 400 amp frame, 250 amp trip. So I'm done with my secondary panel board. It'll selectively coordinate up to 8,000 amps which is good because if I change that transformer or if that transformer comes in at a different impedance value that's lower than 3.6, I'm covered because I can go up to 8,000 amps. That would have to be a very low impedance to get me up to 8,000 amps. Uh, and you can do that analysis, you know, run the equations and see what your, I call that breathing room in your design. Uh, so if the, if the uh, transformer comes in at a lower impedance, then uh, I know what that tolerance would be. All right, so for uh, for picking the primary device. Now, what I remember, these two devices, B5 and B6, do not have to coordinate with each other. Uh, remember that to do that evaluation, if the, the way I do that analysis is I go through a process. I'll say, uh, if I lose this breaker, what loads do I lose? I lose B1 through B4. If I lose this breaker, what loads do I lose? B1 through B4. I lose the same load no matter which breaker opens, so I do not have to selectively coordinate those breakers uh, with each other. But I do have to selectively coordinate this device with that device just to do that evaluation and make sure that that analysis uh, is is accurate. Now, what I, I don't have to do is selectively coordinate those at 5,767 amps. I've got to make sure those selectively coordinate with the reflected current to the primary, which is only 2,400 or 2,500 amps, okay? Because a transformer doesn't stop doing its job just because it's a faulted condition. It will still transfer the voltage. It's still transposes the currents, uh, I'll have lower currents on the primary at the higher voltage than I will have on the secondary, right? So they still do their job and I have to selectively coordinate that BAB20 with whatever I pick on the B as B6 for that uh, line side feeder breaker that feeds that transformer and they have to coordinate up to 2499 or 2500 amps, um, not the 5767. And I can use the tables again to do that using 24.99 as my uh, starting point on the tables. So if I go to my tables, I know that that primary breaker cannot be greater than, is that right, uh, 225? I just wanna double check. Yeah, 225. So I just wanted to make sure, cause I did some copying earlier. Uh, I, got, I, I can't let that breaker be, uh, the lowest minimum trip cannot be greater than 225 because then I would not be able to use that breaker, right? So none of the, all of these breakers that are in this list, all of these are less than 225 amps. So I can use any one of those circuit breakers. The next evaluation point based on the 2499, 
uh, I will have to go through my tables and see what values down here will exceed twenty four ninety nine, right? And if I look at these uh, these devices, that's twelve hundred amps, one thousand, fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred. Woo, I got close on that one, 22, that's only 600, 1,200, and 2,300. So none of those are, uh, are any good for me. So I can't use any of those circuit breakers in this process. So now I go to the next size up frame. So I'm in the K-frame breaker again. And again, I have to do this evaluation for the 225. Any of these exceed 225. I can't use this because that's a 400 amp. Thermal magnetic keyframe breaker. Um, boom, 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 boom. 225. That would be the only one that I would not be able to use. Why did I cross those out? Can't exceed 225. Uh, the, the key number here is the 2500 amps. 20, 24.99, look at this, I'm right at 2,500 on that one there. So I could use my electronic trip unit, 125 amp frame. Now, 125 amp frame is gonna be less expensive than a 250 amp frame. So if I was worried about cost, which we all are, we wanna make a most cost efficient design, I would use one of these two. I would possibly go with the 125. Now, uh, that is pretty doggone close to 2,500 amps. I would not uh, would not want to be using a 2500 amp because if my impedance goes haywire, then I am SOL, so to speak. So a safer design, a more flexible design would be using the 250 amp frame breaker uh, with a 100 amp trip because my, my coordination goes from, it doubles, I go up to 5,000 amps. So that gives me a lot more breathing room it's probably going to be a little bit more expensive. I'm not sure uh, the price difference between these. I'm I don't I don't deal with numbers like that. But uh, but I would probably use uh, that uh, 250 amp breaker uh, to provide the flexibility and avoid any nuisance tripping on startup. Although uh, the 125 amp probably wouldn't give me nuisance tripping. I'd have to plot that on the transformer curve. Uh, but uh, the 250 amp is probably your better, more flexible design choice. So I sit down and I say, okay, now I have picked, based upon the tables, I picked a, I have a 250 amp frame. I can put this at any trip level I want to. I can, I can put it at 225 amps. I could lower it. The, the, this long time pickup value will dictate the size of that conductor, right? So that is, um, that is a critical point in, um, in understanding why I may pick a lower long time pickup than uh, say a 225 amp. Because again, remember the article 450 uh, for transformers, that table gives me the maximum size over current device. It doesn't mean I have to use it. It means that's my maximum size. So we went through this entire uh, process to select those overcurrent protective devices for that transformer. Now, I'm gonna take a look right now and I'm gonna go up to the comments and see what kind of questions we got in our chats. All right, I have never understood why. Okay, so Don Gunnier was, okay, I got that one. Uh, what's the response to Don's comment? Could you send the link to the Eaton uh, Breaker Fuse Coordination Selective Coordination Tables? I can definitely do that. I will put that down in the, uh, I'll put that down in the in the the notes of this. But uh, what I'm going to do now is I am just going to see how fast my computer is here, and I'm going to do Eaton Selective Coordination. All right, so it's not too bad. Go. I broke it out as a separate. So I just did a, a quick Google, and um, you'll notice it, you know, it says support. Consulting engineers. 
our consultant's uh, website, Consulting and Engineering Resources for Power Distribution is a great location for even more than selective coordination. So we have uh, a great, if you do eaton.com slash consultant, you'll get to that webpage, which has a lot of good information. Uh, there's some videos here to understand. There's the selective coordination designer that I talked about that will help you maintain and make sure you don't pick a device that won't fit, you can't wrap steel around. Um, and it'll give you a little one-line diagram. There's the Busman's. I think somebody asked me for that link. This is the uh, Busman Selective Coordination uh, brochure, which I believe, I'm just going to scroll down through here to see if no, we don't have it in there. Busman CH, Selective Coordination Breaker Application, Selective Coordination Application Paper. Open in a new... All right, so selective coordination tables. So these are our circuit breaker selective coordination tables. And you'll notice uh, uh, we have, uh, those are all the revisions. Talks, the, the front gives you a little dialogue on, uh, on, on what these, you know, coordinate, what these tables are, et cetera, how they're, how they're supposed to be used. Uh, a lot of what I just talked about with regard to uh, which devices have to selectively coordinate with each other, which ones don't, is right in here. And um, so there's a nice little table. And then they break down the tables into the um, into steps. Right? So and they give you a an analysis on how to do exactly what I just showed you. You have the load side breaker, you go over to a number that exceeds your available short circuit current, or, I mean, if you say, well, I don't, you know, this is not a, uh, this is not a code requirement. I want to selectively coordinate to the arcing fault current. And, and you know, you can do that. You can do, two, uh, IEEE 242 tells us that the um, most common fault in a, in a power distribution system is your arcing ground fault current, uh, which, which we calculate is in IEEE 1584. So you could take the arcing current and say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to coordinate to the most common fault in a power distribution system. You can still use the tables in that regard as well because, uh, for example, that BAB, the BAB20 downstream of an F-150, and I had this discussion with, uh, with an engineer from, uh, it was a healthcare engineer, and uh, I asked him, I said, well, what kind of fault current uh, would you expect to see at, say, a 150 amp panel board inside your power distribution system? He says, oh, we could see something as low as, as 5,000 amps or 4,000 amps. I said, okay, let's say uh, 4,000 amps. He says, yeah, uh, and, and it'll probably be higher than that, but you know, 4,000 amps uh, as a low as a low uh, ballpark figure for that, and based upon where it's at in the power distribution system, at 150 amp panel, and, and you know, they're they're buying although they're they buy 10k breakers in some cases they buy 22k breakers because the interrupting readings are higher, but let's just go with five with 4,000 amps at a 150 amp panel board with an F150 as a main and a BAB20 as a downstream. So I said, uh, in, a, in a 517 system, you're ignoring fault current. Well, what's the most common? And they'll say, well, three-phase bolted faults won't occur. Uh, you, you have the arcing ground faults will occur, which the arcing currents will occur. I said, okay, arcing ground faults are somewhere around 60, 70% or whatever that is. Let's just say 50% for, for giggles, right? 50% for round numbers, 4,000 amps bolted fault current, 50% is the most common fault current that you'll see in this power distribution, in this application. He said, absolutely. And, um, and so when you look at that and you go to the tables, you know that the BAB20 downstream of an F-150, anything above 1500 amps is going to open. And I, and I, and I showed him those tables and, and, and he sat there and thought a little bit. And, and, and if you think about it, even if you're going to coordinate to a lower fault current value, the tables can still help you, right? So if you say, three, I don't agree with three-phase bolted faults, it's not an Article 700 system. I'm doing this for a client who wants a level of reliability, doesn't want complete reliability of a, from a cascading event. You're going to coordinate to the arcing fault. Fine. You can still use the tables, especially if you're down there in the dirt in 150 amp breaker. Even if you're up in, in these values, depending upon the fault current, your arcing currents can be considerably high. So in any case, this table shows you that value. 
And it also tells you uh, whether the, the device is a plug-in. So this gets into understanding the continuous amps, the number of poles, because your circuit's gonna need to know that, your voltage rating, you're gonna need to know that as well. And then your interrupting current ratings, you're gonna need to know those. And this is, uh, these are our new trip units. So our new power defense line of circuit breakers. Uh, these are, again, you have your 15 to 125 amps, tells you whether it's a instant, uh, uh, a, a, um, electronic trip units, all that good stuff. Type of trip is NIT. And if we go to note one, one says NIT is non-interchangeable trip unit. And uh, IT is interchangeable trip unit. So those would di be different types of trip units on that frame breaker. So you have your interrupting ratings, you have your voltage ratings, interrupting ratings for all the different breakers that you could possibly select. So all of these tables up front just are making sure that you know how to apply it for voltage and interrupting rating. And whether or not you need two pole, three pole, you know, you may pick a breaker and say, I need a single pole, pick a, pick a circuit breaker and go, it's not available in a single pole. It's only available in a three pole or a two pole. So those are other things you got to think about. All right. So then you go down to, um, uh, these are your power breakers, your magnums, your big breakers, those are the big boys. And again, these are all interrupting ratings based upon voltage ratings. And now you get into the tables. So these are the power defense to multi case circuit breaker selective coordination combination test data, all values in KAIC RMS uh, current level. So that's uh, I sh uh, that's kiloamps. I don't, I don't know that I would put IC. That's interrupting current, but it's kiloamps uh, available fault current. And uh, th these are the, basically what we did. So this is a uh, 100, two 100 amp circuit breakers. This is a 100 amp circuit breaker, thermal magnetic. Uh, it can't be adjusted. It's just a single 100 amp circuit breaker. And it'll coordinate up for all of these breakers, uh, BA, BR, BAB, HQP, up to a 40 amp, up to a thousand amps. So if you have a 100 amp panel board, and you have 40 amp or a, a 15 amp circuit breaker. If you have a 100 amp panel board, more than a thousand amps of available fault current, they're both probably going to open. So uh, that's what these tables will get you. Uh, again, you have your breaker family and you have your load side breaker. Um, and you have your table eight, which is your power defense uh, for 480 volts. So this previous table was at uh, 480 volts or less. So table 8A. Table, and this is still table 8A. These are larger trip units across the top. So that's all your tables. So this is basically your selective coordination tables. And you can see these are, you know, it's an extensive document. Uh, very extensive. Uh, table 8B, let's see what 8B says. Selective coordination combinations, 600 volts. So our Canadian friends have 600 volt uh, solutions. And these are those tables for that. Okay. Uh, let's just scroll down here. Just going down and seeing this is table 8C. This is our series C and multi case circuit breaker combinations, uh, 480 volts or less uh, combination to, or series C to G. So these are just different series types of breakers to, uh, to this device, to these upstream devices. So you got to just read the, read the titles of these tables. That's series C and G to series C and G. That's not our power defense breakers anymore. These are now your the, the ones that I had in my PowerPoint presentation. Your F frames, your JG frames, those are still all valid. Uh, so we, we added new tables to this document based upon our new release of our new circuit breakers and, um, and whatnot. So that is our circuit breaker tables. And uh, the fuse tables, uh, CH, those are the DIN rail class CCs. That's not on this. I'll, I'll put the link to the fuse circuit breaker tables uh, a little bit later, uh, down in the bottom of our link if I, if I don't have time. So I'm taking a look at the chat here real quick. Um, before I do the chat, I just want to take a look at... Uh, I got the YouTube up and I have my chat. Okay, so Kevin Ryan, he says, the arcing fault being the most common along with Florida's long track record of only requiring coordination, Long before the NC required in 2005, along with economic considerations, I think that's the bigger issue is the economic considerations. 
Uh, for Article 517.99, only requiring coordination of 0.1 seconds. We have been designing hospitals that way for a long time. The code is a minimum standard and doesn't prevent designing it for full selectivity, but it will get very expensive and healthcare costs uh, a lot already. Uh, yeah, you know, I did a presentation with uh, uh, to a healthcare group of engineers. The electrical distribution is a very, very, very small part of the overall design of a healthcare. And you think about all of the other things that we're doing uh, for a reliability perspective, separation, all of that good stuff. Um, you know, you have uh, hospitals are not cheap. You know, it's it's uh, it's a, a very expensive uh, endeavor. And yes, I would highly advise you go above the bare minimum in 517. Uh, you should be looking at your overcurrent devices with regard to some level of current. I don't care what you pick. You can say I'm going to I'm going to coordinate to 50% of the bolted fault current, 80% of the bolted fault current, the arcing fault current, the ground fault current. Pick something. If you're ignoring fault current altogether, you really don't know anything about the performance of that power distribution system because you haven't done any evaluation. Now you can say it's never happened to me. We hear people say that a lot. I did. I get that a lot in 70E classes. I have guys who won't wear PPE because they'll say, it's never happened to me. Um, uh, you look at, uh, look at uh, what's his name? Um, Donnie's accident. Look at Donnie. He never wore PPE. For how many years he was in the industry, he says, never happened to me. I know everything there is to know about this. But he's now the biggest advocate for PPE and 70E practices from an electrical safety perspective. All it has to do is hit you once. So... Um, the rule in 517 comes from 99. So 99, that is true. The 99 uh, gave purview uh, from a performance requirement for that, uh, that standard uh, for, from, from, a, from a selective coordination perspective. Uh, so I'm going to give you just a, well, you know what I'll do is I'll uh, call up SKM here. And... Um, no, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to... I'm not going to call up SKM. I'm going to grab a uh, slide deck that has a little bit about that 0.1 seconds to help you understand a little bit more about that. Um, I believe that was my first week. If I'm not mistaken. I think it was Tuesday of my first week. I did a selective coordination. So I did a presentation and I have a, a on a YouTube value because I got a little bit more time here. 11.30, 12.30, 1.30. We are due to stop at uh, 12 at 1.30. Um, I did a, uh, I had a, a slide deck that was associated with selective coordination and I covered, I believe I covered 0.1 seconds in that, um, uh, in that, in that presentation while that opens up. So two questions were missed, one from Sager and one from myself. Okay, let me look up. Cost aside, if you have done your selective coordination, what is the benefit to choosing an adjustable breaker versus thermal mag? Um, okay, so if I have two circuit breakers, one that selectively coordinates, both of them selectively coordinate. One is thermal magnetic and one is electronic chip unit. The electronic trip unit device is going to give me more flexibility with this trip curve. Now, I'm selectively coordinating to the three-phase bolted fault current. The instantaneous region, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have the advantage of arc flash reduction because my arcing currents are definitely not going to be in the instantaneous region. If my bolted fault current is not in the instantaneous region, my arcing currents are definitely not going to be in the instantaneous region. So I will see higher incident energy levels in a selectively coordinated system. Now, um, when selective coordination first hit the streets in 2005 from a code requirement, I was in a role at that time, and I still do a lot of teaching. I've done a, I, I, if those on the phone who know me know that I do a lot of educating across the country with IAEI, IBEW, IEC, NECA, um, and other organizations. Uh, 
I can't think of IEEE and, and anybody else out there that, that wants to understand these things. And I try to help them understand how our products work to help them achieve their goals, whether it be a design requirement or code requirements. That's sort of what I do. And, and some people like it and some people tell me I'm full of blowing smoke. But in any case, I, uh, I try to help people understand the performance of these devices. And when selective coordination first hit the streets, I was out educating design engineers that if you meet the code requirement for selective coordination, you are going to see higher incident energy levels. And the reason is because you are putting intentional delays in your system. I wrote an IEEE paper way back in the day um, that highlighted that as an issue. And I was doing education. And um, Jimmy Dollard, uh, Local 98, who I'll be doing a presentation with on Thursday this week, I was presenting to uh, Codemaking Panel 13 at the time to help educate them on the hazards associated with this. And, uh, you know, I, I, in fact, I think I was uh, talking about 0.1 seconds as one of those solutions because 0.1 seconds ignores fault currents. You're, the chances of you having a uh, uh, faster clearing time because you're in the instantaneous region is higher. Not a sure thing, but it's higher uh, in, in that application. So I was explaining to people that, you know, as you put these intentional delays in, you are adding intentional delays. So I, um, I, I, I went through that process and Jim came up with the public input on 24087. Can't remember. I think it was the 2011 cycle. And, and that was one of those, I remember the conversation, the, the, the phone call conversation on that topic with him as he was educating me on what he wanted to do with uh, select with the, uh, with the uh, 24087 and the arc reduction technologies like the arc reduction maintenance switch or zone selective interlocking or the arc quenching technologies, all of those help address the issue of uh, incident energy especially in a selectively coordinated system. So I can effectively have my cake and eat it too. Uh, before, if you think about it historically, if you read all the textbooks, they'll tell you selective coordination is not a, is not a science. It is an art because you're balancing the capabilities. You're balancing uh, the, the amount of damage you have to your power distribution system because of those delays. And, and I translate that into the, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, incident energy. Uh, you're talking about worker safety and all of those things. Uh, and uh, you balance that with the, with the level of coordination that you want to achieve. So for your lower fault currents, your arcing currents, your, your ground fault currents, your uh, overload currents. Yeah, I can get you a high level. And as you get into the overloads and all that, you're getting to a more volume of events. But when you have that short circuit event, then um, you're going to give up. You're going to just gonna say, well, I'm just not designing to that. And, ho and, and, and what I used to do is let my customer know that, that look, I'd say, look, uh, you have a process. You want to increase the reliability of this. I don't coordinate to the three-phase bolted fault current, but I do coordinate to the most common fault current, the arcing ground fault current, uh, based upon IEEE Red Book, because you never want to make your own design decision. You don't ever, you want to base it on something. So I would reference IEEE and say, look, the most common fault is this. I coordinate to that. For the majority of the faults you have in your power distribution system, you'll be fine. If you do have a short circuit, if you do have an arcing event, uh, an arc flash event or whatnot, I, I try to design for that arcing. I didn't have IEEE 1584 at the time, but if you did, you'd say, if you do have that bolted fault current event, then, or something greater than that arcing current based on 1584, then, you, um, then, then you're going to probably cascade, and you'll have this ex cascaded outage, you'll have an extended outage. Now, on a life safety system, you know, what I was doing outside of the nuclear experience that I have uh, for the industrial power systems and the commercial power systems, especially in commercial, they didn't give a crap. You know, and an Oracle 700 system doesn't have to have a generator. I could have a, I can have a completely reliable system. I just have to get them out of that building within a certain time period. 
so I would coordinate to the uh, to an arcing fault current, which I used a percentage because I didn't have 1584, and it worked for me then, and it probably would it could work for for one of you guys uh, and gals out there with uh, with regard to your application. So, uh, but but uh, with an electronic trip unit, I get the added feature of being able to add arc reduction technologies. So even if if I don't if I'm if I don't want to use an, uh, an electronic trip unit, if I do use an electronic trip unit, I can provide an increased level of safety with reducing the damage to the equipment and providing technologies that will protect our electrical workers, and I will achieve selective coordination based on either a code requirement or a design goal. So I can get you both low equipment damage for reliability and getting back up and running again, uh, should a, an event occur, and I can get you selective coordination. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna look at, I'm looking again at this. Cost aside, if you've done your selective coordination, the rule, two questions, it says two questions. Two questions above that were missed, one from Sagar and one from myself. So. I got Gabby's. I got to look for, I have a question. Does series rated systems require selective coordination? Whoa, series rated is the opposite of selective coordination. Remember what occurs in a series rated system. I have, um, and I covered this in my selective coordination uh, class, but here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick search in this power point. Series rated. There it is, right here. All right. Series rated solutions are inherently selectively coordinated, true or false? And the answer to that is false. Series rated solutions, what they leverage is I have a, I have a, uh, a, a higher interrupting rating above and a lower interrupting rating uh, downstream, and those two together will interrupt the fault they will both trip should I have a fault in that power distribution system. So in this case here, I have a fully rated system, 65K breaker upstream, 65K breakers downstream, and my available short circuit current is, 60, uh, is 31,000 amps. Every one of those circuit breakers can, can uh, open on that case. That is what you will have in a selectively coordinated system. You're not going to have a series rated system. I've seen some tables published that they'll say, oh, this is series rated. I would ask questions. When something doesn't smell right, ask questions. 65,000 amp, this is a series rated system. Now in this case, if that, for that 31,400 amps, if 31,400 amps flows through both of those, what I'm telling you is they're both gonna open to clear that fault. And they, together, they will, uh, they will clear that fault Neither the 65K rated breaker or the 10K rated breaker, which is interrupting 31,400 amps, is going to have harm to itself because they are both going to open. And that does not mean selective coordination. That is the opposite of selective coordination. Because I am I'm telling you that for those fault currents, those high fault currents, they will both open. Uh, good question, though. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through the 0.1 second discussion that we were having. So if you look at 517.30G, what uh, it tells you for the, and somebody had put that in the question, for the period of time that a fault's duration extends beyond 0.1 seconds, and this is outside of selective coordination, this has nothing to do with selective coordination, this I'm just, the NEMA definition uh, I think is, uh, is important to understand. NEMA tells us in, in their document, and I'll try to put a link to that downstream, uh, down below, Localization of an overcurrent condition to minimize outages to the circuit or equipment affected. That's the same for selective coordination. Uh, the difference is how you accomplish it. You select and install overcurrent devices and their rating settings, ensuring separation of their time, time TCC curves beyond a specific beyond a specific time without regard to fault current magnitude. That's the key. They don't consider you don't have to calculate fault currents to do a 0.1 second. All you need to do is plot two curves, hide everything below 0.1 seconds, and you're done. You don't have to calculate fault currents outside of, do you have the right interrupting rating? So if I look at these two breakers, and I say there's uh, there's 20,000 amps of bolted fault current 
or arcing fault current. I don't care fault current that's flowing through these two. I don't care if it's arcing fault current, arcing ground fault current, three-phase bolted fault current, 50% uh, of the three-phase bolted fault current, whatever that fault current value is, if it is in that region, I can tell you those are both going to open from a performance perspective of those two breakers. What we do in 5.17 and, and NFA-99 is we say, look, we're, we, we have that issue down there. We have an overlap uh, because that fault current is high, but we apply a, uh, a, we basically hide everything below 0.1 seconds. I call it the selective coordination tool, the, uh, the coordination tool. You hide everything below 0.1 seconds and make sure you have separation of curves. But we know that that 20,000 amps is a problem. You, you just disregard that and all you're looking at is your overload currents. So you know that you are coordinated for an overload. You don't know how they will perform for a short circuit current. You don't know how they will perform for an arcing fault current. You don't know how they will perform for a ground fault current. You just know that on an overload, they will coordinate. And, and that's how we, uh, we do uh, coordination as part of 517. All right. Uh, let's take a look. Um, and we have tables for that too. We make your life really easy when you're doing coordination. If you're ignoring fault current and you don't care about that and you're, or, or any types of levels of fault current, you're just worried about overload currents, you don't even have to look at a table. We have tables, but we have design guides that'll tell you exactly what breakers to use in those applications because it, it doesn't matter what the fault currents are. We make your life really easy. We'll tell you what panel board to use, what, what breakers to use right out of the get-go. And that's easy to quote. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to install and, and all that good stuff. It makes all your equipment lower, smaller. You use smaller conductors, smaller panel boards, smaller breakers. You don't have to use electronic trip units. And more often than not, your arcing currents will probably be in the instantaneous region and you'll have lower incident energy values. Uh, I can't speak to the reliability of the system, but I can tell you it will be more cost effective and it will be uh, all the way around, even outside of the uh, panel boards and switchboards and all the all the stuff that you buy. All right, so I'm looking at the comments again. Cost aside, the rule five seventeen. We saw that two questions. We saw, I think we got those two questions. A bit of battle. Yeah, I'm not even going to get into the ninety nine stuff. Is there any value to changing the bottom of the TCC from point oh one to point zero zero one? Aren't the minimum opening times of okay? So if you have the tables, there is no point of extending those below 0.01 seconds, in, in my opinion. The tables tell you what happens when your fault currents are high enough to be in the, inst the instantaneous region. In fact, my, my data will probably be better than what you'll see on a, on a curve down below 0.01 seconds because we'll, you know, it's, it, it's confusing to read a time current characteristic curve. It, those, those curves are not the... Uh, the easiest uh, uh, things to to read. So I'm going to close this real quick, and I'm going to go back to the website. I can find my website. All right, so if you go to eaton.com slash TCC, I'm going to check my time. I'm still good on time. While that's loading, I'm going to look, and I'll explain uh, that a little bit. Um, SKM won't plot below. They will. They can, SKM can plot below 0 0.001 seconds. I, I, I would, I, you say they won't. I don't know if you mean they can't. Uh, they can, and you can, uh, you can configure that in SKM uh, if you wanted to. I could, um, TCC settings, I could put that minimum range to 0 0.001 if I wanted to. Oops. Delete that. I can take this down to 0 0.001 if I wanted to. Uh, but the data in the database would have to be there. And unfortunately, they don't add that data in the database, uh, or fortunately or unfortunately. I don't believe they have to, in, in, in my opinion. Um, but you know what my opinion is like, right? Everybody's got one. So uh, I think I somewhere I went to TCC. I thought I typed it in, www.eaton.com slash TCC. Um, and so the SKM can plot that. You'd have to put the data in their library. And I've actually done that before. <laughs> I've done that before. I've plotted it down below where we had that. Molded case circuit breaker time current characteristic curves. Uh, but I'm, I'm, 
E frame, F frame. I don't know if any of our F frames go down below. Let's just take a look. I'm just gonna. I'm. I'm gonna. We'll we'll take a look at a time current characteristic curve while that's opening. As I recall, it was somewhat heated battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. E tap will allow you to set the bottom of a TC at 0.001. I've done it. Yeah. So will SKM. So will Easy Power. All of those applications will let you put that at 0.001. I, I on SKM. I mean. You know, I could, uh, if I double clicked on this and I said, uh, take this down 0. 0.00001, I could take that down to 0. 0.00001. Uh, and if I had the data down to 0. 0.00001, I would show that curve. Uh, I would have to go to the library. Um, I would have to go into, uh, I think it's not document, maybe it is document. Um, this isn't a, this isn't a, yeah, it's document library. This isn't a class for this, uh, but you can open that library and you can create your own devices if you wanted to. And so I'm not going to open it. Um, so here's the series C frames. I'm going to see if uh, we go down. Oh, that's the electronic. I got to find a, some of our older thermomagnetic breakers do go down lower than 0.00 one seconds there there it is here you go here it is see that I'm freaking awesome <laughs> pull that one out of my butt all right so here is uh if you looked at a tcc curve on uh, on on skm or edsa or any of these they cut it off here at 0 0.01 but we do have the data that gets you down to 0 0.001 seconds and if your, you know, if your curve came, uh, your uh, downstream device came down this way, and then, and then down, and your fault current was in this region, you could probably use this curve. But in reality, in reality, your fault currents are not going to be that close. Um, I do have one example that I did a while ago where I actually used this curve, or I don't know if it was this exact breaker, but it was one of these breakers. Uh, where I used it, and I did show that I selectively coordinated using a TCC curve and uh, not using the tables. The tables put me into a larger breaker, but I did was able to show this on the, the TCC curve. Uh, but the tables make your life so much easier. Um, all right, so that's that's the TCC curves, and, and you can go in and all... Now, here's the other thing. So you're looking at this. You know, you've got to read. The TCC curve is... Is can be very complicated. You you got to read all the details. They don't plot everything on there. So this is um, this is an EHD breaker. Uh, this tells you the interrupting. This is a 15 amp breaker. So that's a single 15 amp breaker. Let's go up to these. You know, look. There's they give you the two times, two and a half times. These are the settings for uh, for this circuit breaker. There's your long time pickup, excuse me, long time pickup, short time pickup, short time delays. But look at all the notes. Curve accuracy applies minus 20 to 55 degrees C. Now, if you're applying it outside of those temperature zones, you're gonna, you, these, these curves are gonna be different. Um, there's a thermal memory effect that can act to shorten the long delay. So you've got to read the notes associated with the circuit breakers to fully understand what you're doing. You may say, I do 0.1 seconds. I don't care about all this. That's perfectly fine. That is your prerogative. But if you're on the side of, I want to understand these devices for their proper application and go the extra mile for my, for your customer, for whatever their design goals may be, they may say, you know what? I want 99, I want nine, I want five, nine reliability in this power distribution system. You're going to be looking at these details. Right, um, your your Article Seven Hundred systems, your life safety systems, your your petrochem facility engineers, they look at these details. Uh, those facilities that that need an extra level of reliability will be looking at uh, and understanding these trip curves. I've worked a lot with with those guys, and they're they're sharp cookies. Uh, they're sharp people. So this is uh, so there's a lot of information. There's your plus or minus uh, uh, percentages. And you'll notice uh, that, you know, you have your long delay set up, so the plus or minus 30%. So when you enter, when SKM enters these in, you can, um, 
you can put that into the information. Now, never use ETAP, only SKM. In SKM, you can set the bottom lower, but the curves won't be accurate, so it doesn't plot them. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that, Kevin, because if you put in that data, the SKM, SKM is not like, it's not like you got a, a, a rocket pencil. It's only going to give you what these curves tell you. So if you put in this curve, it's going to be that uh, SKM will give you that information that you put in for these curves. And that information is only as accurate as the manufacturer's data, right? They're only regurgitating to you what you put in. And, and that's why uh, SKM, whenever you start their software applications, they'll tell you all of their data needs to be interpreted by a licensed professional engineer or somebody qualified. Is it possible to have series raised? SKM does have selective coordination table info. Ah, they do. SK Kevin, they do. Did you ever try to use it? <laughs> I have. If you can, we're going to do a one of these seminars and you can educate people on how to do it. I've asked some people at SKM who tried to show me that example and I had a hard time with them as well being able to demonstrate the use of those tables. Um, I think it needs to be better. I've not been able to get it to work uh, myself. That doesn't mean that you have not. So Kevin, you might be a rock star on that. I look forward to your YouTube video. Uh, and if you want to do one together, I'm more than happy. Henry, some modal case circuit breakers have a clearing time less than 0 0.01 seconds. Um, hold on. That is, uh, that's the end of this program. I appreciate uh, the, the feedback and the input. I'm going to answer these questions. I'm going to put the code up.